Well, good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Morton Blackwell, president of the Leadership Institute, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this, our first post-election Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast. Uh, normally, it would have been held last Wednesday, but uh, last Wednesday, we had not, we, we knew in advance we weren't going to quite have these rooms uh, cleaned up because we had a truly massive election night party. We had over 550 people come through here uh, last Tuesday night, by far the, the biggest uh, one that we'd had. It was co-sponsored by the Leadership Institute and, and uh, Richard Vigory's uh, organization, and it was, uh, it was quite a night. Um, we live in interesting times. The, this morning's uh, newspaper reports that the uh, soon-to-be chairman of the House Education and Labor Committee, John Klein of Minnesota, says he is going to reinstitute uh, through, through uh, his committee and the House, if he can, the D.C. voucher program, which is, which is certainly, <laughs> certainly uh, desirable, but it's going to be a, a confrontation. There are those who say uh, that uh, because it's the logical thing to do, the president is going to move to the center. Tru truly, I doubt that. I don't think he is capable of doing that. He is an ideologue, and his base um, will uh, would be outraged if he did try to move to the center. But it, it will be fights like this that will, uh, I think, keep the conservative gr grassroots uprising uh, f fully uh, prepared to participate in the public policy process between now and the 2012 elections. Uh, little update, the Leadership Institute has this year uh, at our schools trained uh, 8,291 people. Uh, that, is, that is not counting the thousands who have taken advantage of our new online training, which uh, <laughs> debuted on the 4th of July. Uh, it's been a, uh, a, a truly exciting and busy year. Uh, you have before you our uh, current 2010 school schedule. It's the uh, goldenrod colored uh, piece of paper that you have. We have a number of schools left before the end of the year, including uh, one that is uh, certain to draw a lot of people, our Capitol Hill Staff Training School. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there are going to be a lot of new jobs opening up uh, on, on Capitol Hill, uh, both in terms of member staff and committee staff. Uh, in September, we had a hundred applicants for uh, come sign on to our conservativejobs.com uh, website. Uh, and then uh, in October, we uh, um, sent out a call uh, for more uh, applicants, and we've had well over a thousand come in uh, in, in less than a month. Uh, now, so it's it's a uh, it's a boom time for people interested in in uh, certainly Capitol Hill jobs, and there are many of them. But I urge you to review the upcoming schools and consider attending one of them or sending a friend. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Sean Stewart. He'll offer an invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Sean is currently serving as my intern here at the Leadership Institute. He has a bachelor's degree in English from Clearwater Christian College and a master's degree in liberal arts from St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. Sean was raised in Florida where he assisted his father in his real estate business and, and in his campaign for city council in Cape Canaveral. Sean? May we pray together. Our God of all sovereignty, your goodness is inexpressible and inconceivable. In the works of creation, you are almighty. 
in the dispensations of providence, all wise, in the gospel of grace, all love, and in your Son you have provided for our deliverance from the effects of sin, the justification of our persons, the sanctification of our natures, the perseverance of our souls in the path of life. Though exposed to the terrors of your law, we have a refuge from the storm. Grant us always to know that to walk with Jesus makes other interests a shadow and a dream. I thank you for the privilege of having our guest, Mr. Patton, here. And I pray that you would be with him as he speaks to us and that we could learn from his example and that you would have us to emulate those things that are honorable in him and how he has been a faithful worker for you. I pray that we all will be faithful workers in the paths that you have called us to. I thank you for all these things, and I pray that you would be with us and that we would stay faithful to you. Amen. May we pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, I want to take this opportunity now to introduce a, 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 an interesting uh, guest, just to stand up so that you can, can see him. We, uh, we have uh, with us here at the Leadership Institute this week a guest from Europe who is uh, spending a week uh, getting briefed on all the activities of the Institute today. He's accompanying me in all of the activities that, that I'm doing. He's a very fine young man, um, and uh, he's, uh, he's certainly a nobleman. He is, uh, he is an archduke. He is uh, Archduke Imre uh, of Habsburg. Uh, Imre, would you stand up so people can meet you? And now I, I want to introduce to you uh, Andrea McCarthy to talk about our conservativejobs.org. Uh, I, I, I kind of think I may have stolen a little bit of, of her uh, thunder by talking about the numbers. Uh, she is our new director of the Employment Placement Services at the, at the Institute. She works to connect talented conservatives to work in conservative public policy in both the public and private sector and she's using new media tools and our broad uh, conservative network here at the Leadership Institute. Before taking her current post here, she was our director of recruitment. She, uh, she was responsible for developing marketing strategies for the Institute and strengthening our position as a leader in political technology training. She's originally from upstate New York. Uh, she's an alumna of Cedarville University, where she majored in history and political science. During her years at Cedarville, Andrea was elected vice president of the College of Republicans and was a member of Omega Mu, the political science honor society. Andrea? Good morning. What a great time to be a conservative, huh? Good times. Um, it's making my job, my new job, very, very fun, very rewarding. I'm enjoying it a lot. I've not been at the Post very long, but in the week and a half that I have been, it's been incredible. And Morton set me up very well with his earlier remarks. I'm just going to talk a little bit about conservativejobs.com and a new, a new project we're working on with Capitol Hill. Um, first, Morton mentioned that in the last month we've had well over a thousand job seekers register on the site. I just found out in the last seven days that number is 575 new job seekers just in the last week. And a lot of that is um, attributable to the, the elections that we just had, but also um, Conservative Jobs just got a brand new website, just launched on October 19th and it has been incredible. A lot of hard work went into that from Phil Natalini, Joe Metzger, and my predecessor, Megan Olszewski. So a lot of the credit goes to them. But I want to talk to you really quickly about our project on Capitol Hill. We believe it's very, very important to staff these new conservative members' offices with conservative staff members. So we have joined up with the Republican Study Committee and the Steering Committee on the Senate to uh, 
replace conservatives from conservative jobs in those offices. So we have we've set up an email address that's conservativejobs2011 at gmail.com and all the applicants <laughs> that I meet with and all the the interns on the hill and everyone's been warned about warned about been notified of this <laughs> email address that they can send it to and that's the first t kind of vetting process that the the conservative staffers are using as they go forward to hire for these offices. They're also using conservativejobs.com as a vetting site as well because uh, applicants have to go on there, create a profile, fill out a public policy questionnaire so they can be sure they know what types of people they're getting in these offices. So we're just really excited to be working with them. It's a great time for conservativejobs.com, a great time to be a conservative. So thank you for all that you do to make this possible. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Andrea. And now to introduce our speaker, I'm presenting to you Chris Doss. He is a grassroots trainer at the Leadership Institute. I have frequently gone out on uh, the road with Chris. He's a great lecturer. He spent 20 years working in the uh, political sector. He worked for three governors and a House speaker and in, uh, and in Congress and six state legislatures. Uh, he wrote legislation adopted in over a dozen state legislatures and worked in campaigns both here in the United States and in Europe. Chris, come introduce our speaker. I don't think anybody uh, here is without being familiar with the death tax and how we have all fought for the right to uh, die without having to pay the federal government for the privilege of doing so. But uh, what some of you may not know is that Dick Patton has been working on this issue since 1981, <coughs> and still we have to pay to die. Now, Dick Patton began this momentous journey back in the Supreme Soviet of Seattle in 1981. He was part of a multi-generational family business, and he gathered over 200 signatures. Uh, we hope with a little bit of help, and not solely himself. 200,000, I am so sorry. Uh, uh, himself and some, some help, and managed to get uh, this initiative on the ballot in Washington State, and despite uh, the uh, Soviet of Seattle, managed to get it passed with 72% of the vote. And since uh, 1994, the American Family Business Institute, since this is an issue that uh, worst hits family businesses, the American Family Business Institute has been working on the issue and making some progress in a number of states. And hopefully we see a wave that has started that will bring us a little closer in the nation. Now, in the course of this, he has uh, had uh, a number of aspersions cast his way and has been called a lot of names, a couple of which I can refute because Dick Patton certainly knows his lineage and the sorts of names that would uh, <laughs> reflect badly on that I know uh, are, are totally untrue. Uh, and his, his uh, lineage is reflected in a number of honorifics. Uh, he is a, uh, an officer in the Sons of the American Revolution, the National Society Sons of uh, Colonial New England, and I want you to uh, take a good look at his blazer before he leaves. It reflects his membership in the baronial order of the Magna Carta. He is a member of the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company of Massachusetts, the Military Order of the Crusades, and just to make sure I wasn't missing anything, I spoke with him this morning, and sadly, he is not descended from the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. <laughs> but for all of you, I hope most of you saw the wonderful art, uh, article in the Washington Examiner on Sunday, in which Morton Blackwell repeated himself for the multiple thousandth time on what makes a movement. The networking, the camaraderie, getting to know one another, and how this 
makes a movement. And it certainly was reflected in my introduction to Dick Patton. And although I've known his name and his movement for many, many years, I just met him at the election night party and was introduced to him by two friends of mine that I met working in campaigns and doing some politicking with. I've known them for over 10 years, and they are from Sweden. My introduction came to him from two Swedish conservative friends of mine. So as you remember our principles, what we're fighting for, remember that the friendships and the networks we build can lead all sorts of places, and two foreigners can introduce us to some of the icons of the conservative movement. And I'm very proud to present to you Dick Patton. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, the subject today, of course, is the death tax. And we're going to look at it both in depth, but we're also going to look at it in light of the revolution that took place last week. Uh, so we're going to look backwards, and we're also going to look at the present and how that reflects as we look forward on the issue of killing the hated death tax. Now, today is, there we go, today is a historic day. Uh, today is day number 314 of no death taxes. For the last year, for the very first time in 96 years, America has had no death taxes. That, of course, is the good news. The bad news is that in a mere 51 days, the death tax goes from zero, where it properly ought to be, to 55%, which is the highest death tax in the planet. And, of course, the most hurtful death tax on planet Earth. Now, as we look at just the overall issue of the death tax, I think we have to start with, with a basic question. Whose great idea was this? Who was sitting on some congressional staff, or, or what member of Ways and Means was sitting in the Ways and Means committee room and woke up and snapped his fingers and said, I know, when mom and dad die, let's take half their stuff. Who thought that that was such a great idea? Because that is exactly what we are looking at in our immediate future in a mere 51 days with regards to the death tax. What I'd like to do is take a look at a number of facets. Some of them are a little bit philosophical. Some of them are very, very practical. And I'd like to begin with the most practical thing. As we look at last week's revolution, I think we all know that one of the things that played a role in the hearts and minds of the American people is the very common sense issue, the building block of jobs, the very thing that allow us to be uh, economically independent in America. Well, jobs plays a very significant role in the death tax. Uh, our foundation, American Family Business Foundation, uh, hired Douglas Hulse Eakin to take a look at what is the effect of the death tax on jobs. And of course, here we've got, let me remind you that we have a situation where it is America's family businesses that provide 57% of the American jobs here in America. As um, Congress is being called on the carpet, as President Obama is being called on the carpet for where are the jobs, well, the jobs are coming from America's family businesses. Of course, the very families that the death tax goes in every, each and every generation and confiscates half of their capital. You know, it doesn't take that much logic to be able to connect the dots between jobs, family, businesses, and the death tax. Um, you know, my good friend Chris mentioned to you our friends from Sweden. One of the things he didn't mention is five years ago in the socialist nation of Sweden, these two friends that, that he referred to, Anders and Suzanne, led the movement that successfully repealed the death tax in socialist Sweden. And what was the issue? It was jobs. It didn't take that much effort to connect the, the dots. But Douglas Holtz Eakin showed in his study that if we got rid of the death tax and it stayed gone so that families could plan around it, it would add 1.5 million jobs to the American economy. Now, at the time that he rolled this study out, he made an interesting comment. He kind of looked up at the ceiling. He said, you know, we have a president who has just spent upwards of a trillion dollars to, quote, unquote, create or save 3 million jobs and has nothing to show for it. And here we have an absolute solid way that we can go back and get halfway to that goal, add 1.5 million jobs to the current unemployed in America, 
and he's got a choice to make. He needs to choose what is more important, the jobs or this beloved concept of him that it is, of his, that it is government's job to redistribute property and wealth because he's at a choosing point. So was Nancy Pelosi, so was Harry Reid, and by the way, they paid a very real consequence for that. We'll talk about some of those electoral consequences a little bit later. Earlier this year, I was invited back to Sweden to speak at a death tax conference back there. Uh, what was happening in Sweden at that time is they had a national election coming up just like we did uh, in that election. At that time, earlier in the year, it looked like the socialist coalition was going to prevail. And the woman who would become the uh, prime minister of Sweden was already talking about bringing back both the death tax and the wealth tax. And so this conference, international conference, was put together. There were 21 uh, representatives of, of 21 different European Union nations, but the issue was family businesses, survival, and the death tax. And uh, as I got up and, uh, to speak, um, you know, my comments were, were received with great interest and great enthusiasm, uh, and the questions from the audience were, were interesting and very, very, very insightful. But the thing that was the thing of, gr of greatest consequence of this was the very last question asked. And there, there was a gentleman who was sitting, you know, right down in the second or sir, right about where you're sitting, and he raised his hand. And I had no idea who he was, but he raised his hand and he asked this question. He said, when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, he said that each and every generation should start all over on their own so that everybody starts equal. How do you defend a system that guarantees inequalities of beginnings from generation to generation? So I looked at him, scratched my head, I figured, okay, you know, he probably grew up in the Swedish public school system, he's probably a little confused. Okay, here's what I didn't know. His name was Sven Olaf Loden. He had been the previous Minister of Enterprise in the prior Socialist Coalition government, and he kept showing up at these meetings with a very disruptive attitude. But I didn't know that, so, so I, you know, I looked at him and I said, sir, you know, let me start with disagreeing with your interpretation of the wealth of nations, Adam Smith, but since you're focusing on historical examples, let me lead you to 150 years before Adam Smith. And um, John Locke was the founder of the concept of property rights in Western civilization. It was John Locke in the 1600s who said, if a man can work hard and save and gather and invest, he should be able to give or bequeath whatever he's gathered to whomever he chooses. Now, if you go 400 years before John Locke, on the day of June 15, 1215 AD, the signing of the Magna Carta, uh, an event that uh, Chris alluded to as part of my lineage, so I take very, very great pride in this. But I said, if you look at the Magna Carta, if you go back and look at the document that was signed, I think we can all agree that the flame of the concept of political freedom in Western civilization was lit on that day. If you look at that document, one third of it is devoted to the preservation of the right of inheritance. And of course, indirectly, then therefore, private property. And so as, as I looked at it, I, I said, you know, throughout the history of Western civilization, the principle of Private property was viewed as something that was immovable and it was sacrosanct and it was a part of the civilization until the middle of the 1800s when the history of the world changed. In 1848, Frederick Engels and Karl Marx wrote a pamphlet called The Communist Manifesto. And many of you may have read it, it's not a big document. They have a 10 point plan for the implementation of their worldview. Point number three, is the abolition of all right of inheritance. Now Marx knew very clearly, if you abolish all right of inheritance, a couple of things happen. Number one, within one generation the government owns everything, part of his agenda. Number two, you break the link between parents, their children, and their grandchildren. And that was also a part of his agenda. And I looked at him, again, not knowing who he was, I said, now I'm not trying to uh, allude that everybody who disagrees with me is a Marxian. Well, half the audience knew who this guy was and they busted up laughing. They knew the joke and I didn't. Um, but I said, Here, here's what has happened is, is since Karl Marx published that document, there have been very, many, many variations, philosophical variations of Marxism. You've got everything from you know, hardcore Stalinism to 
uh, Maoism to communism to the softer versions of socialism like you have here in Sweden, uh, to progressivism, but every, every single one of these philosophical variations holds this absolute, inheritance is bad. And this is where we part company. This is where we have two worldviews colliding. Those who believe that inheritance is bad versus those who believe inheritance is good. Those who believe that private property is sacrosanct and we should have the right to pass it on to our children. Those who don't. Those who believe in political freedom. Those who believe that it is government's job to redistribute other people's property and wealth. And at this point, um, Mr. Loden just kind of slunk down into his seat, had nothing more to say, and slunk out of the meeting. Well, again, I didn't have any idea who I was talking to, and, and this was the, the, the close of the session, so we went out to the coffee session, my wife and I, and, and um, Anders, who was the guy who put on this, this entire conference, comes storming up to us with, with this big smile on his face. He says, Dick, we've got to talk. And he takes Monica and I into the coat closet, and he says, Dick, he says, do you have any idea who this guy was? I said, no, I don't, so he told me. And, and I said, wow. He said, not only that, he keeps showing up at these meetings, derailing our conversations, and nobody has ever shut him down until you did today. This is the high point of the entire conference. And so, but what, you know, the reason I share this story with you is because what this battle over the death tax is, is a complete clash between two entire worldviews that have been at war since 1848, are very much at war today, were very much in play in the revolution that took place last week. As we look at the various questions regard, and issues regarding the death tax, you know, it's hurtful, it's unfair, it comes at a bad time, uh, it takes other people's, you know, all of these things, I think you can boil all of these issues down into a pot to a core question. And let me just lay this core question before you. The question is this, do we actually have property rights or are we merely tax-paying serfs that after a lifetime of hard work and saving and gathering, somehow when this thing stops beating, that our property reverts to the government as if somehow they owned it to begin with? That really is the question. Uh, Morton and I were talking about The Road to Serfdom, which of course is one of, one of the phenomenal books uh, of, of the last hundred years. And, and that's exactly what we're talking about, and that is exactly what is at the core of this issue regarding the death tax. Uh, Chris also mentioned that in 1981 I killed my first death tax in the state of Washington uh, with phenomenal results. The, one of the spokesmen against me was a guy named Clarence Borley who was then the director of the Washington State Department of Revenue Division of Inheritance and Gift Taxes. And one of his statements during during this battle was this. He said, inheritance is not a natural right, but is merely a civil convenience that is granted by a benevolent government. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the core of the problem. This is the core of America's frustration in the revolution that took place last week, where we have bureaucrats, whether they are elected or unelected, who are looking at all of our freedoms and saying, we, the government, can grant you these privileges, but they come from us. We, of course, know far better than that. We have a Declaration of Independence that says that our rights are not privileges, but they are rights granted to us by our creator, and no government can take them away. But once again, this issue is the crux of what this very battle is, and the death tax is squarely in the middle of it. Now, let's switch from the philosophical to the practical in one fell swoop. Let's pivot 180 degrees and talk about what happened in this round of the elections as it pertains to the death tax. As American Family Business Institute began to prepare for the upcoming elections, uh, we, like many others, smelled an opportunity. And of course, this is the very year where the death tax is at zero and is on, on the edge of going to 55%. So what do you do? We launched the death tax repeal pledge signing pro program. And what we did is we approached, one by one, every single candidate for House and Senate of whatever party in this race and asked them, one by one, to sign the death tax repeal pledge. Now, as they sign that, then what do we do for them? Well, the first thing we do is we provide them with all of the talking points they need so that they can immediately slide it in to all of 
their speeches. Number two, we provide them with all of the research behind those talking points so that they can do it with great confidence and greater depth when needed to do that. Thirdly, we have our public relations firm that did press releases throughout the district and throughout the state of every candidate who signed and We got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of great press articles out there on behalf of our pledge signing candidates. And then finally, for the final 37 days of this electoral season leading right up to almost literally the election, uh, we had a massive road trip spending 37 consecutive days on the road doing nothing but televised events with our death tax repeal pledge signing um, candidates. So what happened? Well, some stunning things happened. At least they stunned me. First of all, 502 candidates for House and Senate signed the death tax repeal pledge, 502. Now, this, of course, is pre-primary, but more than half of them uh, survived the primary and were in this final election. Now, you can see here, well, it's a little bit light, but here's a copy of one of the, the pledges. You can see who signed it. Uh, it's a congressman. We, we may have heard of him. His name is John Boehner. Uh, actually, uh, every member of the current House leadership stepped up and signed the death tax repeal pledge. Also, the NRCC played a very proactive role in assisting us in this project. And while it wasn't just Republicans who signed this, for example, let me give you one example, is Governor Manchin from West Virginia, is also probably one of our pledge signers as well. But nonetheless, we went from 502 to what are the results? So here we are, we've invested all of this in there. We've got all of these people in play. We've brought the death tax into the national conversation. So what do we have now that we went through all of this? Oh, I'm sorry, and here, here's some of the televised events that we did. You know, here's one in Kentucky. Here's one down in, in Pennsylvania. Here's another one we did in Illinois. And this is what we did for the 37 days leading up to the election. Okay, so what happened? Let's take a look at the House and the Senate individually. Number one on the House, we now have 119 newly elected death tax repeal pledge signing House members. A great place to start. In addition to that, we have an additional 126 currently sitting House members who always have and always will vote in favor of death tax repeal. Okay, we're now looking at 245, but in addition to that, we have 21 Democrat, Democratic members who will probably vote for full repeal, and by probably, I mean they have voted for full repeal in the past. Beyond that, there are an additional 50 swayable Democratic members, each of whom has individually been determined to be swayable or convertible with the proper um, encouragement. And what that gives us is, and, and this is our, you know, the top number that we believe that we can achieve in this current House, 316 possible votes. And if you're a little bit slow on your math, let me, let me remind you that 218 is a majority. This is 98 votes in excess of a majority in the House of Representatives is what is conceivable as the outcome of this project. Now let's turn around and take a look at the Senate. This is, of course, very, very encouraging. In the Senate, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. In the Senate, we have 12 newly signed death tax repeal pledge signing senators who are in the incoming Senate. In addition to that, there are 37 sen and by the way, in both of these categories are Republicans and Democrats alike, but we have 37 uh, senators who always have been and always will be with us. This brings us up to 49. In addition to that, there are six Democratic senators. Now, we're saying they could vote with us, but the fact of the matter is these are senators who have voted in favor of full repeal of the death tax in the past. And then in addition to that, there are eight what we call swayable senators, and for individual reasons, we have deemed them swayable, and we, we again believe that with the proper um, influence, the proper encouragement, we can bring them in uh, when we need them. Uh, this gives us a top theoretical number in the Senate of 63. Once again, a very, very encouraging number, albeit, of course, this is going to be in a Senate that will still be under the leadership of our most personal enemy, Harry Reid. But nonetheless, you know, these are very, very, very encouraging numbers, and they forecast some very good potential work that we can do 
in the Congress yet to come and what will be the new House and the new Senate. But before we start looking at the new House and the new Senate, I think we have to stop and ask ourselves, but what about the lame duck? Okay, in the lame duck, one of the big issues right now is the Bush tax cuts. What are we going to do with them? Who are we going to extend them to and for how long? And this is, if there's one thing I would like each of you to take home with you and do something about, is this. If you take the original bill, which I have with me here actually, this is uh, H.R. 1836, these are the Bush tax cuts. If any were to, anybody were to take a look at them, you'll find that the entire middle section is devoted to death tax repeal. And yet, in so many of the conversations with those who are currently negotiating, there's not one mention of extending the current zero death tax. If I can ask you to do one thing, please, please encourage your senators, your House members, and particularly those ones who are leading the conversation to make certain that the death tax is absolutely included as we're looking at extending any Bush tax cuts. If we can take the current zero death tax and if we can extend it out two more years, that'll make it just that much harder for our enemies to bring it back and revive it here in America. So this is my single solitary request. By the way, for any of you who represent organizations, we have a coalition letter here asking the leadership of the GOP House and Senate, please, for these reasons, include the death tax. And um, Morton, you and I can talk about this later, but there are other organizations represented as well. Any of you, please give me your card. Let me know that you would like to be on this coalition letter that will be going up to Congress, and, and we will include you on that. So let me just kind of circle the wagons here a little bit and get a little bit historical with you. Um, it was my observation that the original American Revolution was preceded by a Tea Party. Last week's revolution was also preceded by a Tea Party. With that in mind, let me simply give you these parting thoughts. No taxation without respiration. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Two short answer questions. One, who was the clever person who moved the phraseology from estate tax to death tax? And the second question is regarding the Magna Carta. Uh, my, precious, my most precious possession is my body. Is there anything in the Magna Carta which addresses the, uh, the bodies being a, a possession that, uh, a possession that uh, one should have and make a determination on? OK, interesting. Well, in, in terms of the Magna Carta and us, you know, the Magna Carta was, was, as, you know, was written a very, very, very long time ago, and it really addressed possessions more than bodies. But you know, what, what I find fast, two things about the Magna Carta that I'd like to share with you. Number one is originally, because you know, it was 25 barons who forced the king to sign it, and the original draft said, we want inheritance rights for our families, for, for the noble families that we represent. But by the time the actual verbiage came out, not only did they say, for the rights of all free Englishmen, if that wasn't clear enough, they had an entire section guaranteeing the property rights of Jews. So this was, this was a very, very, very widespread thing. Secondly, um, in America, in, in the original Massachusetts colony, you may or may not know this, but the seal of the Massachusetts colony was a man who had a gun in one hand and the Magna Carta in the other hand. And I think that creates the perfect picture of where we are right now. <laughs> so, and I'm sorry, your other question was? Who came up with the phrase? Oh, death tax. Death tax, death tax. Okay. Um, you know, it, a lot of people will say the term death tax was created by the right-wing spinmeisters. And uh, it certainly is promoted by the right-wing spinmeisters, and I think we could probably give Jim Martin more credit than anybody. But the fact of the matter is, the term death tax is a very common term that was born among the law firms of those who did estate planning in the 1930s. And so within that internal community, the death tax has been used for, for decades. It is not a new invention. 
It was always there, at least always there for the last 80 years. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, I would say that probably Jim Martin did more to encourage the use of the term death tax uh, to begin with. So, and Jim de de deserves actually a lot of credit for a lot of what's been done in this movement. Uh, are there other questions? Preston. Yes, um, wait, wait for the mic, please. Oh. Great presentation, Dick. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the House, they've got things called discharge petitions. I'm not aware that exists in the Senate. Maybe it does. It's a constitutional issue. But with those kinds of numbers that you showed there, um, obviously somebody could mount a filibuster against it. But is there any, any provision in the uh, Senate? No, no there aren't. Things? But actually, Preston, if you look at, at the rules of the House and Senate, they're very, very different, particularly as it pertains to the minority party members. On the House side, if you are in the minority, you have no rights. You can't do any, you can't move legislation, you can't do any of that. In the Senate, the minority has a great number of rights that minority members in the House do not. And so there are a lot of procedural things that can be used to force legislation in the, in the Senate that on the House side they don't. Now, of course, we rule in the House, so, so those rules work in our favor. That'll be great, you know. We may well see a death tax repeal vote come up in, oh, let's say the middle of April. This, is, this has happened more than once. But, uh, but the fact of the matter is, in the Senate, uh, a lot of this will come down to a deep knowledge of senatorial procedures and that entire labyrinth of all of those. Uh, we have in the past brought in some very, very, very knowledgeable consultants that just you know, help us divine our ways thr through this. But uh, that's where a lot of this battle is going to be effectively fought in this coming Congress. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Shaq Hill asking the question. Thank you. Two things. One, what's the likelihood that the president will sign this? And then second, the argument has always been a revenue uh, to the Treasury, not so much a socialist to break the inheritance of and the right of inheritance. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on how the repeal of the death tax will uh, increase revenue or decrease revenue to the Treasury? As well. I certainly can. Thank you. And let's start with the, the revenue question. Uh, to put this all into context, if you look at simply 2009, last year, and you look at all of the money that the federal government spent, and you look at all the money that it brought in in inheritance tax, in, in estate taxes, it was six tenths of one percent. Okay, far less than a rounding error, number one. Number two, uh, Steve Enton did a brilliant study for American Family Business Foundation where he showed conclusively that for every one dollar of death tax that the government collects, it actually loses two dollars in revenue. And you probably don't want me to delve deeply into that, but I can tell you, number one, it's there and it's available for anybody who'd like to take a deep economic look at his conclusions and how he arrived at them. Uh, but let, let's just say killing the death tax not only is not going to deepen the deficit, it will make it better. Uh, on, on the presidential front and a veto, uh, you know, I think if we're going to get something signed in the next two years, probably our best opportunity is if we can get death taxes included in the Bush tax cuts and get it extended out for, for let's say, two years. That is something that the president ostensibly would sign. But the fact of the matter is the death tax, in terms of the president's core beliefs, the death tax is a self-enclosed you know, his own isolated package of self-enclosed socialism. And I think we all have our own opinions of the president and his core beliefs and the issues of socialism. I do believe that for that reason, that reason alone, he would veto it. Uh, with that in mind, what we have done is we kept the same, our death tax repeal pledge signing team is still in place. And we are now going after every single emerging presidential candidate on the GOP side to get them signed and committed on the issue right now in anticipation of very likely we will get death tax repeal pledge, uh, uh, death tax repeal legislation through the House and the Senate. It will be vetoed by the president. It will then probably become one of the top five issues in the next presidential campaign. And we are already preparing for that. Can I share our website? If you want to go to the one place where there's more information than any other place on the planet on the issue of the death tax, 
whether you want the online petitions, whether you want the stories of families and the nightmare of the death tax, or whether you want all of the deep studies that have been done, the groundbreaking economic studies, or the news articles, go to nodeathtax.org and it'll all be there. And I would encourage each and every one of you to do this one thing this morning. Visit the website and sign, sign the online petition. And that'll help uh, in a very easy way for you and a very meaningful way to us to move this issue forward. Group. Thank, you, thank you so much. Dick, I re really appreciate your coming. It was a very timely uh, and interesting lecture. And as a token of appreciation, let me present to you uh, one of the Leadership Institute's newest model of Adam Smith Tide. Oh, very cool. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I invite you all to join us on Wednesday, December 1st. Uh, our uh, next Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast will uh, have as its featured speaker Matt Kibbe, who is president and CEO of Freedom Works. And I invite anyone who is interested in uh, purchasing Adam Smith uh, apparel, uh, Connie. And Marshner, who was here until a moment ago, has, has on one of our uh, uh, Adam Smith scarves. They're Adam Smith neckties and other items, and you can acquire them from Kathy Graham, uh, my assistant who is over there. And afterwards, she'll be uh, at her desk up on the fifth floor. You can visit her there. Anyone who is interested in a tour of the Institute building, I uh, invite you to meet with Seth Nichols uh, here at the lectern uh, after the breakfast. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.